Hello everybody, in today's video we're going to take a look at the automatic direction finder slash non-directional beacon side of navigation. Now one of the things that has come up after kind of reviewing some comments as well as getting some general ideas is that there's a lot of desire in order to check out how radio navigation works and unfortunately there's not a lot of basics out there as far as how to file different types of navigational aids. So I realized before we do any sort of videos that actually involve anything along the lines of you know, doing an ADF approach, for example, it probably might be a bad idea to do a couple videos on explaining what ADF and VOR are. So anyway, so the first things first is we're going to look at ADF and NDB. So what an NDB is, is it's represented by this on any given chart. And basically what it is, is a gigantic a radio magnetic device that makes noises in all direction electromagnetically. On board of your aircraft, you have something called an automatic direction finder. That's the ADF part of the NDB. And what this does is it allows you to know where that noise is coming from, assuming you've tuned to the correct frequency. So in this particular case, this website, by the way, is Luis Montenegro. He does a really good job of showing up all these different tools so you can play with it before you get in the simulator. We will go flying today, but I just thought we would, again, take a look at the basics here. So first things first, uh, we have our aircraft here. We're on a heading of due east. In our NDB, which, of course, in this little demonstration here, we don't have to worry about making sure we're on the right frequency. We don't have to worry about issues with propagation through the atmosphere. None of those things are problems. But just in a straight-up real-world real situation, you can see if I have an NDB over here, I'm tuned to the correct frequency, and my aircraft is facing in this direction, then my ADF gauge will always point towards it. Now, notice that if I were to grab the plane and move it around, no matter where the plane is facing, it will always have that needle facing where that NDB actually is. Now, how can we use this to navigate? Well, it's actually pretty straightforward. All we have to do is turn our plane so that the needle is perfectly centered like this. And now if we were to go ahead and start moving forward, which we'll go ahead and do in a second here, you can see that we continue approaching that station since we're driving exactly, I should say flying, exactly to where that station is. Now what you're probably noticing is this needle is slowly drifting to one side or another. So we as pilots could come in here and we could go ahead and make little teeny tiny course adjustments to keep that needle perfectly centered. So uh, that's all there is to the ADF, right? Well, n not, e not exactly, not exactly. So um, when you cross an NDB, you get a nice little reaction from your ADF needle. And uh, we'll go ahead and let you see what that looks like in a second. So when we see it in the simulator, you know what you're going to be looking at. Now you're gonna notice it's get tremendously sensitive and it's gonna go wing and flip the other way. There it goes. Okay, so let's make things a little bit more complicated. Let's say, for example, we're over here. And let's also say that I play with this little needle here. Do you notice the needle doesn't change position. This is what makes it different than a VOR. That needle is still pointing towards that station. So now if I want to fly back to that station, I'd simply have to rotate myself so I'm facing it directly and then go ahead and proceed to it again. So again, relatively straightforward principle. It's sort of the equivalent of if somebody claps their hands and you turn your head towards them. Their hands is basically the NDB beacon, if you want to think about it another way. So this is easy, right? Mm, well, we got a problem. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a very, very standard flying problem. Let's say we're facing the NDB station. And we've got everything perfect just the way that we want it. I'll go ahead and reset that card real fast to make things a little bit simpler. We don't have a card in the aircraft we're going to be testing in Flight Simulator, which is a bummer at the same time as it's, we have a better tool. So let's say, for this given example, that it happens to be windy. Let's say that our wind is, uh, let's, let's make it serious, 40 knots at a heading of 270. Now, watch what happens if we fly towards the NDB. Let's go ahead and start the time. And let's let that just cook for a second. What is the needle doing? Yeah, the needle's shifting left because our aircraft is being pushed to the right because of the wind coming out of this direction. So the common mistake pilots make is they say, oh no, and they quickly go like this. They turn the plane a little bit. They point back in the correct direction so it's back in the correct heading. They'll go ahead and say, hey, I fixed it. I fixed the problem. Uh-oh. What's it doing? All right, I'll just keep putting a little left in. I'll keep putting a little left in. Just a little left. Just a, oh, nope, nope, nope. And then a little more left. Okay, nope, 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 oop, nope. Got to give myself a little bit more left. Okay, nope, 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 oop, oop. Okay, almost there. All right, got to cross that station at some point. I'll go ahead and pause it right there. You can see very clearly that we travel on an arc. So that is going to be useless for us. And you're probably going, uh, okay, it, it didn't matter that much, did it? Well, 
in about a week or so, you're going to see a video showing you how to use one of these in order to land an airplane. So imagine if that wind is pushing you off course, and imagine if this is the runway we're trying to land on. If we need to be straight lined up with this runway when we got to the NDB beacon, or <laughs> ATM machine, NDB, we'd be busted because we'd be too far off the center line of the runway to safety land. So what we'd have to figure out as pilots is how much to tilt the plane away, which was called a crab angle, from the NDB to keep this needle perfectly centered. So let's go ahead and fast forward time. Now notice, my plane is actually pointing this direction, but the wind, since it's pushing me this way, I'm compensating for by going in this direction. How do I know it's working? Because the needle is not moving. The standard technique for this, by the way, is to basically go about 10 degrees, watch what the needle does. If the needle stays steady, that means you've found the right crab angle. If you see it start drifting to the right, you're over crabbing. If you drift to the left, you're under crabbing. That's simply all there is to it. Obviously, if the wind is coming from the opposite direction, then you're going to have to kind of do this sideways. But notice, this needle, despite my silliness here, stays in the same position until we cross. So that's the basic fundamentals of this. Let's go ahead and take a look at what we're actually going to be doing today. So let me go flip over here real quick. And here we are in uh, lovely southern Russia here. I'm sure for those of you who are DCS fans know what I'm doing here. We're going to be taking off from this teeny tiny little airport right here, which is Krimsk Airport, for those of you guys curious. We're going to proceed direct to Smolenskaya, which is at 662 Sierra Mike. And it is dot, 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 dash, dash. This is going to be very important to us when we get in the simulator. We're going to proceed direct from here come here and then take a left hand turn and proceed direct to Krasnodar, which is a tree 77. Now you're probably going to sit there and going, oh, there's a lot of NDBs here. I thought they were getting rid of NDBs. You're right. They are getting rid of NDBs, but in a lot of places where it's nice and flat like this, you'll still find them. So if you can take a look, we're going to dial in Krasnodar and we're going to use that to actually bring us in for a landing. Now, in a lot of these countries, these especially former Soviet Union countries, you actually have multiple NDBs in a row with each other that are actually multiples of each other's frequencies. So by a single press of a button, you could swap between the close NDB and the far. It's called the inner and outer NDB. But that's getting a little technical. Don't worry about that for today. So what we're going to do is we're going to have to get this frequency, which is going to be 662 Sierra Mike. Then we're going to switch over to this Krasnodar, which is a Whiskey Papa, which is dot dash dash, dot dash dash dot. Then we're just going to follow the needle all the way in. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at what this is going to be like over in Flight Sim. All right, let's take a look. Whoop, I'm going to go ahead and flip that back on, and we should be all set. Display mode. I uh, shouldn't see that. There we go. Beautiful. Sometimes it gives me a little bit of trouble. Okay, so now we're over here in Flight Sim. I'm going to go ahead and resume, and we are ready for takeoff. we got our airplane ready to go. Everything's looking pretty good. This is definitely a quiet part of the world. It's about 6 o'clock in the morning local time. Uh, weather is definitely about as IFR as it can possibly get, as you could probably imagine. So let's go ahead and jump inside the aircraft for a moment here and take a look at what we need to do. So the first things first is you will not find an ADF tuning radio in here anywhere. This is not a classic aircraft. This is you know, the Beechcraft G. 36. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to come to our PFD, drop to the middle where it says ADF slash DME, and now we can tune in our ADF. So in this case, I'm going to use the small knob. Whoa, I don't want to do that. Small knob, I'm going to go ahead and jump up to 662. 662. Six, enter, enter. Now I'm going to go ahead and dial in my next one. It's going to be tree 77. So I'm going to go up here and go set this to a tree. Don't accidentally press enter twice, you'll be very disappointed. 377, enter, done. So now our ADF has been tuned. That's all there is to it on this particular aircraft. You know, there's not a lot of mystery or anything along those lines with that. So um, how, how do we see the ADF? Well, that's a little bit different in this aircraft than it was in the old days. What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to switch my CDI to VOR mode, get that cheating out of our way, and we're going to go down to PFD, and you're going to see bearing 1 and bearing 2. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select bearing 2, see how it changes my bearing in the bottom, and set it to ADF. Now you're probably sitting there going, you did something wrong because, uh, look, no matter what you do, something's, oh no, what have you done? Um, we, ADF, or NDB, is line of sight. And the real people will say, well, it's not actually line of sight. It does bend a little bit across the atmosphere. Um, in this particular simulator, it's more or less line of sight. So we won't actually detect it until we get airborne. The moment we do detect it, we'll get this beautiful little line that'll enable us to see what we're doing. I'm actually going to turn the wind on uh, naughty mode right here. It looks like we've got a seven knot headwind, which is 
more than enough to cause us some trouble. All right, other than that, let's get flying. Our initial heading today is going to be 100 degrees. Now, I know some of you are looking at this runway going, uh, can you get off of the air in this direction? Eh, it's good enough for small fighters. It should be enough for us. Woo, that is some fun wind. It's going to be a bumpy ride today. 71, V1. And we lift off just millimeters before we hit the end of the runway. Get those gear up as fast as you can. You want to use your VX to clear those trees. Pull that nose up just a little bit. Lovely. Okay. Believe it or not, we have already captured the ADF signal. So if you look down, I'm going to zoom in just a little bit so you can see it. If you actually look down in the middle, there's this brand new blue line right here. That shows where our NDB station is. So if we want to fly towards it, we just simply have to turn the airplane until we center that, just like we saw in that online simulator a little earlier. Clean up the airplane a little bit, bring up the gear, bring up the flaps. Everything's looking pretty good. There we are. Start leveling off just a little bit. And you can see now, as we're just about centered in such a way that that ADF needle, which is that new double arrow, kind of looks like a doghouse in the middle, is now nice and centered. Now I'm just going to set the aircraft up. Whoa, that turbulence is really nice this morning. That uh, We're going to go ahead and center that up real nice, and then I'm going to let the automatic pilot kind of hold us at this angle, because this is a very comfortable angle to fly. Boop. And that's all there is to that. Let's go flip on the flight director. And now it's just a matter of getting this line centered, right? Yeah, I think so. Let's go ahead and do that now. So I'm going to grab my heading hold. I'm going to first of all synchronize it. Now I'm going to go very gently to the left and flip the heading select mode on. So this is going to cause aircraft to turn gently towards this. Now we need to start thinking. So we need to, oh, get that out of there. That's cheating. Also, this screen is cheating too. Go away. Much better. So what we need to do now is we need to keep this needle centered but we don't need to keep the needle centered. We need to keep this needle so that it's pointing in the front and it's not moving left or right. One of the nice things about this particular aircraft is we have the ability to sense what our wind is. So we can see that the wind is pushing us from over here to over here, which means, if you want to think about it another way, if we just wait, this needle is going to start hiking this way. So we can compensate by actually turning the aircraft slightly into this wind on the right. I'm going to go ahead and give it a couple of degrees, just a teeny tiny bit of correction, and see if that needle remains steady during our climb out here. We're not going to go very high because this is a relatively short flight. Now, one thing we need to consider is once we get to that stay, oh, that's a fun color. <laughs> Yikes, I'm actually going to come down here and crack these open just a little bit more. I'm also going to shut off the landing light because that is instant blindness, as I've joked before. Look at that. Oh, boy. I don't like that color. We're going to go ahead and level off at 3,000 feet. So now what we're doing is actually flying slightly to the right of where we need to be flying, keeping that needle from moving left to right. In our little online simulator we took a look at earlier, that needle tends to move quite a bit faster because we sped up time. In this aircraft, you're not really going to notice it too, too much. We're going to go to about, guess about 3,000 here. Then I'll go ahead and level us off and trim the airplane off. Looks pretty good so far. Looks pretty good. Ooh. RPM. And that should do it right there. 3,000 feet. Time to set us up for cruise mode. So in this particular aircraft, you always want to do uh, the manifold pressure before you do the RPM. Easiest way to remember that is always do the handle closest to you and then move your way across. So I'm just going to gently pull the throttle back to get us to 25 inches. Looks good. And now I'm going to gently bring the blue handle back, my propeller control, until we get 2,500 RPM. Again, I don't need perfection here. I just need to be close. Eh, a little too much. I'm actually using a little hand wheel to control that RPM. It's a process, to say the least. All right, it looks good. Eh, I wish I could get it literally not even half a millimeter. It's like a nanometer. Good enough. All right, we'll go ahead and use the auto mixture to help us out with the mixture a little bit. And now we are on our way. We're doing about 162, so it should get us there relatively quick. It's about a 10-minute flight for those of you who are looking at what time it is. Looks pretty good there. I'm getting bounced around. Oh, look at that. We can finally see. <laughs> oh, man. There's just, the, the world is just so beautiful. Just like, it doesn't matter where you live. It's all incredible. I just love these little rivers, and I love how flat it is until you look at that window and you have the Caucasus, which are pretty tall mountains. Obviously, my DCS fans will be going, hey, I remember this part. All right, do you see that needle going crazy? We have just crossed where we need to be. So now I'm going to bring my heading over to tree five, 
and then I'm going to automatically go back and set up the new ADF station. Now since we preloaded it, I'm going to press ADF and then press enter a single time. Watch this. Ah! Do you see how the needle suddenly changed? This is going to take us all the way to Krasnodar, which will allow us to go ahead and set up our nice little landing here, which unfortunately for me is going to involve a traffic pattern like for the first time ever. All right, look at my guess was so close. Oh, nice. All right, let's go ahead and put that screen away real quick and let's figure out what we need to do now. So the ADF, there should say the NDB is basically right here. The wind is pushing us from the left to the right which means this needle is going to slowly track left because the station's going to stay there, but it's going to slowly go this way because we're going this way. So what we actually need to do is bring our aircraft slightly into the left so we're compensating for that fairly strong crosswind. So I'm actually going to take my navigation here and move this up a little bit. Now, people who have an E6B, now people who have an E6B are probably not watching this video because this would be a little bit redundant for those pilots, but hey, you never know. Some people might look it up and say, hey, I want to get one of those now. Um, anybody who has an E6B, if you ever flip over on the wind side, you can actually use this 10 knot correction to calculate what your WCA is. There's actually a really, really cool chart that you can dig up online. If you don't want to try to do it by hand kind of a thing like that. Let me see if I can find it real quickly for you so you can see exactly what it looks like. Uh, I think I found it actually. Let me go show it up for you real fast so you can take a look. All right, let me go flip it on. I'll make sure again, we're cruising anyway, so we might as well. Let's flip that on real fast. Hey, there it is. So you can see here that you can actually see the angle between the wind direction and the true course. So you could actually see, oh, it's a 10 knot. And you could actually see well, what angle is it relative to us, it's roughly 90 degrees to us, which would mean a 10 knot kind of cross here. And then you could use that as a way to kind of estimate exactly what you want to. The easier one to see is you actually see something that looks a little bit like this that allows you to calculate the crosswind versus headwind component. But unfortunately for us, we already have the crosswind and headwind component. So you almost have to work backwards in order for that to work. But again, it's getting a little fancy. Don't worry about it too, too much for today's example. All right, swing back here, make sure everything's looking pretty good. I'm pretty confident. Ah, just like I expected. I'm noticing here that the NDB station is over here on our right. But remember, we're intentionally staying to the left of it so that we can allow it to stay in the same position for our entire approach here. This is uh, definitely instrument territory because uh, we keep zipping through clouds here. Ah, I already see Krasnodar right there. So now the interesting thing is we're going to attempt to do a visual approach into their large runway there. And what we're gonna really have to cross our fingers on is the fact there's no clouds at low altitude. Otherwise, uh, we're gonna have to do a little flight simulator magic. So again, this is a wonderful example of how in order to go straight, you have to go left. Because you can see that even though that needle is off my right, it's not shifting to the right, it's not shifting to the left. A 10 knot wind, the nice thing about this little needle here is it tells me that over well, basically one hour, I will have moved 10 nautical miles to the right of where I want it to be. Now, since I'm traveling 170 knots, you can just work out the ratio. It works out to be something like 1.7. 1 1.7 at 60 nautical miles is about two degrees. Not bad. Don't worry about the math for that. That's getting a little fancy. Honestly, you can do this. Another thing some people always ask me about ADF, is there an automatic pilot that can follow ADF? That's not a thing as far as I'm aware of. I've never in any flight simulator ever encountered an ADF that we can actually use. There's also one more thing that you can do with an ADF, which is really, really cool. And that's that you can figure out where you are based on the angle on the ADF. You're saying, well, what do you mean? Well, while we're cruising, we might as well take a look at that as well. So let me go flip back over here real fast. You'll notice that, um, let's say I'm right here. And you'll notice I have two NDBs. If, for example, let me go ahead and do this. I'm just going to say plan real quick. These two NDVs could actually be used if I know the angle of both of them relative to where I am. For in this case, if it was tree 5-8 in this way and it was a 7 tree this way, I could take a signal off of this one, take a signal off of this one, and then draw it on a chart in order to exactly pinpoint my precise location on that chart. We're not going to worry about that too much because you're not going to see that during instrument approaches either. All right, let's flip back over here real quick. Make sure everything's looking pretty good. I think it's actually time to start thinking about descent. We're almost to our destination. Actually, we're early. Let's go ahead and start reducing some power here. Set our altitude to 1,000 feet. We'll go ahead and disable the automatic pilot. 
And the one thing I have found that works much, much better for me, to be honest, is simply moving it the way that I want it to be moved and then flipping the automatic pilot back on. That's sim just simple. All right, you can see that the NDB station is shifting a little bit to our right there. It does not surprise me. It just simply means that we overcorrected for it. Also remember, the closer you are to the station, the more aggressive the corrections are gonna end up being because of the fact you've gotten so physically close. One thing that we don't get in the simulator, which is kind of a bummer, because in the real world it's very distinctive, is just how sensitive that needle actually is. It'll literally jump around on you. And even though it might have an advertised 50 nautical mile range, the actual range can be quite a bit more significant than that, as you'll find from time to time. Now, one thing you might be wondering as well is, um, what happened to my map here? I just went down here and used the big one, and you can actually change between different modes here. Like, you can see just how incredibly close I was able to navigate without even looking at the chart at any point. Now, I'm actually going to flip to this view real quick to help me uh, do my traffic pattern, because, uh, you know, us visual pilots or instrument pilots don't do traffic patterns very often. All right, going to go kind of run through the landing checklist mentally here. We need to make sure we're on the fullest fuel tank, which we are now. We're going to make sure our landing light is turned on. We're going to make sure our cow flaps are about 50% is fine. Everything is ready to go. The only thing we need to worry about is flaps and gear. Now, when you do an instrument approach using ADF, what you're going to end up doing is you're basically going to be flying a certain course until this needle points at the specific runway. Let me show you what I mean. If I were to actually take this aircraft real quickly, let's go ahead and take a very aggressive turn here, and scoot like this. There we are. Now, if you come down here, you'll notice the ADF is pointing right around the number three. That would mean that if we had a runway we were landing on, say runway four, if we were to turn right now, we'd be perfectly lined up for the end of the runway. When we do these actual approaches later, that's a coincidence. That was a coincidence. I didn't plan that. That would be exactly how we're going to be doing our ADF approaches. Now, an interesting thing, too, with ADF is it's not unusual to couple ADF with VOR in order to do approaches that basically have different ways of discovering what waypoint that you're on. We'll take a look at that when we look at approaches in particular. All right, we're about 1,300 feet here. I'm going to bring us left. Man, would you like a yaw damper on this thing? We're getting bounced. Now, I think it's funny, flying in the real world, uh, turbulence is all the time at normal people altitudes. And I can think of a, more than once when it's like, hey, it's a nice day outside, and it turned out that it felt like being in an unbalanced washing machine the entire flight. You know, that, that, that's fun for the first five minutes, but eventually your headache just, it just does not go away. All right, I can't believe I have to fly a regular traffic pattern. Ah, oh, this feels so dirty. <laughs> Hey, there's nothing wrong with VFR flying. In the real world, whenever I did fly, and again, this is going back a few years, I would typically stick to VFR, even though you can use instrument flight rules or te techniques to get around. Again, this is just kind of interesting. All right, so it's a neat thing that my ADF needle is actually shifted almost straight behind me. If I turn my head, you can actually see the NDB station. It's straight ahead on your left. You can almost make it out. There it is, right there. Looking right at it. So it's kind of neat. You could actually home in on the station if you wanted. All right, we're in the traffic pattern, so we're gonna go ahead and drop our gear as well as our first notch of flaps. Those always go together in this aircraft. Let's take a look, I have three green lights. I am feeling pretty good. Uh, let's see, gas is on fullest, undercarriage is down, mixture, full rich. Propeller, full RPM. Flaps, set, lights, set, speed, not yet. Bring the nose up just a teeny tiny bit. And we can see that even though it's pretty old technology, it works darn well. Now, there's actually a technology that preceded the ADF, which was really amazing. You had to navigate by listening to Morse code. Uh, one thing that I was mentioning earlier is about that Morse code, and I think it's worth mentioning that again real quickly. We can actually identify what NDB station we're on by turning on the Morse code for that particular NDB. So, for example, if I turned on the ADF uh, audio right there, you can actually listen through the headphones and hear what the Morse code from that particular station is. In the real world, it's actually not uncommon to have things like traffic advisories or weather advisories on those stations either. All right, so we're listening for... Okay, we're looking for dot, dash, dash. Bye. Dot, dash, dash, dot. Now it's confusing. All right, let's go ahead and turn on our left base here. Give ourselves a few more RPM. We're descending much too quickly here. There it goes. Whoa, no, 
not as turbulence. Yeah, we brought that bass out way too far. I wasn't paying attention. I was having too much fun with the audio settings. All right, I'm going to kind of stand on the nose for a second here. This is never good for any airplane. Now, I went with the Bonanza on this particular flight. You can do this on any aircraft with a G1000, by the way. A lot of these small aircraft actually have dedicated ADF tools. The only difference is you don't have the benefit of the entire needle rotating like you saw a minute ago. All right, swing around. Looking pretty good. Make sure my gear's down, flaps down. Aw, oh, I almost did it right, but that crosswind is just ferocious. As a matter of fact, the crosswind is so ferocious, I'll let it push me back to the runway. Pretty good. We are awfully low. This is like dangerously low. Of course, I'm not used to landing on runways this big. All right, speed's good. Flaps, actually we're a little fast, but that runway is so long, we could probably land sideways on it and we still have room to land. Yep, that crosswind is definitely taking me all over the place here. Set up a little higher in my seat. All right, we gotta lose some speed here. Okay. So that about covers it for ADF. That's really all there is to it. When we do an actual ADF approach a little bit later on, you'll see how tricky that can be to actually set it up as you're trying to land the plane. But the reality is a lot of it is all timing and you'll see quite a bit of that later. All right, throttle to idle. Come off the end of the runway. See, of course, in the real world, when you cut that throttle, the plane's nose gets so heavy, you literally can't hold it up anymore. Ah, that was nice. All right. Hopefully this tutorial was helpful. Again, we're just looking at the basics of ADF. Key thing is uh, when you go to tune it on this particular aircraft, you're gonna be tuning it right here. And some other aircraft, you actually have a dedicated ADF over here on the left. And that's about all there is to it. Enjoy.